The Seventh Tower by Garth Nix Book One, The Fall Chapter 23 The glowing horn, three times as long as Tao, slowly came closer and closer. Tao felt rather than saw Mila draw her knife. Her spears had been broken in the crash of the sleigh. A short piece of sharpened bone did not seem like much of a weapon against a hunting beast with a horn that could ram through Tal and Mila and still have plenty left over. Slowly, trying to make the movement as hidden as he could, Tal reached into his coat and began to pull out his sunstone. He had it half out when the Merwin finally worked out where they were. A terrible whistling screech filled the air, and the luminous horn suddenly rocketed forward. Mila shouted something and pushed Tal away. She ran, too, but forward, toward the Merwin. Tao could see it clearly now, illuminated by its own terrible horn. The picture he saw then would be etched in his mind forever. The Merwin was even bigger than Mila's description, at least twenty stretches long. It looked like a crawl snake from the Beastmaker game, all thin and sinewy, except it had four long clawed flippers instead of legs, and shiny black hide instead of scales. It had only one eye, a huge golden eye, long and slitted, with a lid that kept flicking open and shut several times a second. The other side of its narrow head showed an empty scarred eye socket, clearly a wound from long ago. The horn grew from a ridge of bone between the Merwin's eyes. Under it was the creature's mouth, big enough with its many shining teeth to eat Tal in a single gulp. As Mila charged toward it, the terrible horn struck. It came straight at the ice curl, and for an instant, Tal thought it would go right through her. But she dodged, and almost got past. The Merwin flicked its head, and the ferociously sharp point of the horn sliced across her chest, the force of it throwing her to the ice. She did not get up. The Merwin hesitated. It started to move toward the motionless body of Mila, its horn scraping the ice. Once again, Mila's words went through Tal's brain. They stick their horn through whatever they're after, and then they bash it up and down on the ice. The Merwin reared back to strike at the defenseless girl. No! Tal screamed. He rushed forward with his sunstone raised in his hand. Faster than Tal's eyes could catch, the Merwin changed targets. It lunged forward, extending its body, the luminous horn coming straight at Tal. He threw himself to one side and would have fallen, but his shadow garb was there to prop him up. Somehow, he also managed to keep his sunstone trained on the creature's one golden eye. Tal knew he would only have time for a single blast of light before the sharp horn struck again. He focused all his thought on the sunstone, drawing upon every fragment of power it possessed, and unleashed it at the Merwin. The flash was so bright that Tal was blinded. The Merwin shrieked, an awful, high-pitched sound that seemed all too close, but Tal didn't know whether he just annoyed it or burned out its one remaining eye. He cursed himself for being so stupid and not closing his own eyes. He could hear the Merwin thrashing around and could imagine the horn stabbing toward him. He started to run, then stopped, disoriented. Maybe he was running toward the Merwin. Shadow guard, he called, and he held out his hand. Something tingling and soft touched his fingers and jerked him to one side. Tal fell and felt the swish of air as something passed him, followed immediately by the sound of the Merwin's horn striking the ice. Either it could still see, or its other senses were good enough to find him. Tal rolled aside, then crawled as his shadow guard pulled at his hand. His sight was slowly coming back, the darkness becoming a mixture of floating blobs and fuzzy light. The Merwin struck again, its horn skittering off the ice near Tal's feet. He turned to face it, his vision coming clear again. It was blind, at least temporarily, its golden eye closed and weeping but it could hear, or smell, or sense, for its head was pointed straight at him, as was the horn. It would eventually get him, unless Tal did something first. But his sunstone was finished, completely used up, and his shadow guard could not fight something like this. Even if he did somehow manage to get away, he would be lost in the dark, without a light of any kind. Without light, his shadow guard would dissipate, and without the shadow guard, he had no way of finding the castle. Perhaps he could get Mila's lantern and knife. Tal started to edge around, back toward the faint green glow where Mila had fallen. He was surprised to see that his blind escape from the Morwen had taken him so far from her body. He was even more surprised when Mila suddenly leaped out of the darkness onto the Morwen's neck. 
She wrapped her legs around it, locked her ankles together, and plunged her dagger deep into its head. The merwin screeched and reared up, its bright horn pointing directly at the sky. Mila stabbed it again, and it flung its head back down, smashing her legs into the ice. But she hung on and stabbed it again and again, despite its writhings and desperate banging against the ice. Finally, it stopped moving, and the light from its horn began to dim. Mila let go and crawled a short distance away. Tal could see the blood on her fur and trails of merwin ichor upon the ice. Tal gulped. He had stood mesmerized while Mila fought the creature. Now he ran forward. Mila lay on her back. Her hood had fallen down and her mask was nowhere to be seen. In the fading light of the merwin's horn, Tal saw that her face was even whiter and her lips were turning blue. The whole front of her coat was ripped to shreds and her fur leggings were rent in many places. As Tao watched, blood began to pool beneath her. Dark red blood, not the blue ichor of the merwin. I die, said Mila, her voice soft. Clumsily, she wiped her wrist across her chest and held it up, all bloody, to Tao. By this blood that we share, blood of the clan, bone of the ship, the quest must... Her voice trailed off, and she seemed to see something that confused her. Her forehead furrowed, then her eyes slowly closed. For a moment, Tal thought that she was dead, but as he knelt by her side, he saw that she still breathed, though shallowly. Taking great care, Tal peeled back her torn furs. He had to force himself to take slow breaths as he saw the wound that stretched across her left side. Having seen it, he didn't know what to do. His sunstone was dead, and even if it wasn't, he didn't know enough to use it for healing. Then he felt a soft touch at his arm. His shadow guard was plucking at his wrist, the wrist marked with the three cuts of the ice carls. Tal stared at the shadow. It was trying to tell him something. It had taken a shape he didn't recognize. Something human. Then it hit him. The shadow guard had assumed the shape of Mila's shadow. It was saying that since she had some of his blood, it could help her. All Tal had to do was tell it to. Shadow guard, shadow guard he blurted out. Staunch Mila's wounds. Before he could finish, the shadow guard flowed over Mila. Most of it stuck to her ribs, but dark tendrils rippled down to her legs and out along her left arm. Wherever it touched, the bleeding stopped. Tal pulled Mila's furs together over both girl and shadow guard. He retrieved the pack and lantern. It took him a moment to work out how to open it up again, then he sat down next to Mila. The shadow guard would need all the light it could get. Even once the bleeding stopped, Tal wasn't sure if Mila would survive. Now he had a chance to think, he wasn't even sure he wanted her to. She had probably saved his life, but now he had the pack and the lantern. He might be better off heading straight for the castle. He certainly didn't want to be bothered with trying to get her a sunstone as well. It wasn't as if she was family or friend or anything. What would his parents say? Tal suddenly thought. What would his father do if he was out here? Or his mother, if she were well? They wouldn't leave her. Only someone like Shadow Master Sushin would, and Tal did not want to be like him. He sighed and opened the pack. First he got out a sleeping fur, which he carefully tucked around the unconscious girl, tilting her up to get it between her back and the ice. Then he set up the oil burner and began to heat some selsky broth. He supposed Mila would need something hot when she came to. What's happening to me? He asked the dead carcass of the Merwin as the broth bubbled. I am Tal Grail Rearum of the Chosen. I'm not supposed to be sitting in the middle of nowhere looking after a, a mad ice carl girl. I should be back home with a new sunstone getting ready for the day of ascension. The dead Merwin did not answer. But someone else did.